Hello, everybody! I'm Zenith Warrior Princess, the cutest of buns, and welcome back to Zen Movies, where I take a look at one of the numerous different films in my collection. And more importantly, happy two year anniversary, everybody! Now, I know some of you may be wondering how I'm here celebrating the anniversary, since I'm currently being tormented by an evil teddy bear. Oh, shit. I'm not meant to know that here. I'm sure you're all wondering why on earth I'm recording this well in advance of the anniversary. Well, you see, after I finished off the first year of Xenoween, I really wanted to go back and take a look at some classic horror films. And seeing how this film is also having an anniversary this year, I've decided that I'm going to record my review of it well in advance. Yep, that's the reason, all right. Totally the reason. Anyway, this time around, we actually have a very special review for the anniversary. Today, we'll be diving into what many people would consider to be the grandfather of the horror genre. Sure, there were silent horror films, such as The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, Nosferatu, and The Phantom of the Opera, but as far as sound films go, this is as old as they come. You might be wondering then why we didn't decide to reserve this review for Xenoween given its significance to the horror genre. Good questions! In any case, today we're diving into the world of the Universal Monsters as we take a look at the 1931 original Dracula starring Bela Lugosi. I'm sure the Universal Monsters need no introduction, but allow me to explain for those unfamiliar. The Universal Monsters are a lineup of classic horror characters who have been the stars of movies produced primarily by Universal Pictures. The original franchise consisted of about 40 films which were released between the 1930s and the 1950s, introducing audiences at the time to horror icons who persist even to this day. The Vampire King, Count Dracula. The monster brought to life by Dr. Victor Frankenstein. The Feral Wolfman, Jack Griffin, the Invisible Man. The Mummy of the former High Priest Caris, and the dreaded Gill Man, otherwise known as the Creature of the Black Lagoon. These monsters are ingrained in mainstream horror media, since not only were they the ones that made horror popular to begin with, but they were also the first to ever attempt a cinematic universe that studios today are obsessed with chasing, including Universal themselves. They have been franchised, remade, spoofed, you name it. There are probably no other characters as famous as these classic monsters. So, it's kind of weird that I haven't seen any of their films, right? Yeah, up until now, I haven't watched any of the classic lineup of Universal Monsters films, much to the surprise and frustration of many of my friends. It's not because I wasn't interested in them, rather, it's because of very personal reasons. When I was young, the first horror films that I was allowed to see were Final Destination and Small Soldiers, which isn't technically horror, but the garbage disposal scene gave Gave me nightmares for weeks. This was during junior high, where I hadn't yet found an interest in horror and was suffering from major sleepwalking problems. After these first forays into horror, my parents wouldn't allow me to watch any other horror flicks because it would give me nightmares that led into lucid dreams, which made the sleepwalking much worse. As such, I couldn't go near the Universal Monsters until around late 2008. However, by then, I had started getting into remakes of slasher films instead of these classic monsters. My love of horror stemmed from slashers simply because they were far more accessible to me at this time. I was far more scared by Final Destination because these were horror films with no true killer. The killer in Final Destination was death itself. There was no fighting it and that truly scared me. But this, the slasher franchises, this was my speed. 
While the killers were seemingly unstoppable, they all had a certain humanity to them which allowed the characters to fight back. I don't consider myself a horror buff, but by this point, the universe of monsters seemed quaint to me. They are classic films, and I will always give them credit for shaping the genre, but the slashers were truly my monsters. They provided this nice middle ground where I could get scared by them, but not so scared that I was having nightmares for weeks. I did see Dracula Untold many years back, which I thought was a fun enough take on the novel, but in terms of the original films that put these creatures on the map, I'm going into them completely blind. Like the later Halloween films, I will eventually begin grouping some of these films together, and I also won't be covering every single one of them in release order, as in some cases, there really wouldn't be much point in doing so. With that being said, I will be giving every first film in this franchise its own review since I'd like to give every monster their due and discuss how they came to be. With that being said, let us journey forth to Transylvania and dive into Universal's Dracula, both versions. So, the interesting thing about the creation of the original 1931 Dracula is that there are actually two separate versions of the film. There is an English language version and a Spanish version. They were both filmed at the exact same time using the same sets, but with different actors. At this point in time, Universal and Hollywood Studios had focused on developing Spanish films for the foreign market, and because of this, they decided to film both versions at the same time in order to cut costs. The end result was two incredibly different takes on the same adaptation, which both released in 1931. For the longest time, the Spanish version was a forgotten film, only mentioned by film historians in the 1960s, but received greater attention after a screening at the Modern Museum of Art in 1978, leading to a popular home video release in 1992. I never even knew there was a Spanish version until Philip brought it up to me, and it just fascinates me how different and similar these two films are. With that being said, I've decided to cover both versions in this review since there'd honestly be no point in separating them given their joint history. As you may know, the 1931 adaptations of Dracula were based on the original book by Bram Stoker, a book many of you have probably read in a literature class because of how enduring this novel became. Written in 1897, this novel has stood the test of time and is still considered a classic to this day. While I haven't read it in quite some time, the interesting thing to me is that the novel was written as an epistolary. It is a collection of letters, diary entries, and newspaper articles that bring us the tale of Count Dracula. It has no singular protagonist, but follows the journey of this creature of the night as he makes his way from Transylvania to England and terrorizes the country. This was a popular format back in the time period, as several classic novels were written as epistolaries, such as Flowers for Algernon and Poor Folk. That said, an epistolary is quite difficult to turn into a film since we have to identify with the characters. The solution in this case was to adapt the Broadway play that had been produced in 1924. Because of the popularity of the play, producer Horace Liverwright brought it over to America and it premiered at Broadway's Fulton Theatre with obscure Hungarian Bela Lugosi playing the lead role. This version of the play centered more on Dracula as the main character and how he would eventually be defeated by Dr. Van Helsing. 
This laid the groundwork for the Universal adaptation, as they focused primarily on the play version when adapting this work into film. In terms of plot, there really isn't much to discuss when it comes to the original Dracula. In many ways, it still feels like an epistolary because of how the story jumps around between characters. Dracula is the main focus, yes, but we follow Renfield as he travels to Count Dracula's castle in Transylvania. He arranges passage for the Count across the seas to London, where the Count has purchased a new castle. After signing all the paperwork, the Count transforms Renfield into a ghoulish servant. Together, they and his many brides traverse across the ocean, feeding on the crew in order to survive, allowing Dracula to open shop in London. From there, it's mostly just a collection of events that happen, where Dracula creates more brides for his entourage, and attempts to turn Mina Seward into a vampiress to rule at his side. However, all the while, Dr. Van Helsing, a professor and parapsychologist, is on the Count's trail, having been called in due to mysterious deaths around the region. He quickly deduces the good Count is a vampire, and the two have a battle of wills and wits to see who will come out on top in the end, and whether Mina will become a vampire as well. The plot is very straightforward, and in some ways is a bit padded because they have to stretch this to film length. They spend quite a bit of time on Dr. Seward and his assessment of Renfield, who has seemingly gone insane and feeds on the blood of insects. However, I think this sets up the count quite well because there is mystery in what his abilities truly are and we slowly discover them over the course of the film. If I had to put my finger on what makes this a classic film, it would be the atmosphere and the build-up. This is very much a slow burn film, which may not appeal to modern audiences who need rage zombies and fast moving plots. This is a film of discovery, as we, the audience, are treated like Renfield, slowly learning just who and what this Count Dracula is. I was personally hooked because of how the Transylvanian citizens are so terrified of the Count and the castle that even going near there is forbidden. When Renfield insists, the carriage driver doesn't stop and throws him and his luggage out while the carriage is moving in order to avoid the presence of the Count. The buildup of this fear in atmosphere carries throughout the film since you are never sure when Dracula will strike. Another difference in presentation is that the film, aside from an opening song, has no musical score. It is completely silent for the most part, given how new the technology was, and I feel that it aids in the atmosphere that they were trying to convey. It is an eerie silence, and they linger on shots with awkward pauses for a few moments to emphasize how tense the atmosphere is when in the presence of Count Dracula. Some may find this a bit slow in places, and to be honest, there are scenes that do drag on due to the film needing to reach feature length. I mean, there are some repeated scenes with Renfield breaking out of his cell, and sometimes I do feel scenes could have been combined in order to convey the same information. However, the majority really sells it for me. When Dracula is first introduced at the castle, he commands the scene. Dracula says but a few short sentences, but they carry such weight that you can't help but feel the horror atmosphere in every single interaction. This is very much a character-driven film about the Count, and I think it truly works. Dracula himself is the true star of the film, played magnificently by Bela Lugosi. Every single second, he is committed to the role with facial expressions and physicality that are slightly inhuman. 
the way he stares at Renfield in the beginning, holding himself back and waiting for the perfect time to strike, is all sold without dialogue. He commands a regal presence, but there's always something off about the way he moves and how infrequently he answers direct questions. When he slowly moves into strike, his limbs become curled and bestial, and this subtle acting is what makes the character for me. Dracula is not a deep character. He's a monster, plain and simple. However, the way in which Lugosi delivers this monstrous performance is simply sublime. I couldn't look away from Lugosi in any scene he was in, although the editing doesn't help because they fade away before he can ever bite someone, and there's a couple times where the fade is far too late, and he's just slowly looming over the victim. Menacing, yes, but... It could have been improved by fading sooner. Van Helsing is another outstanding character, mostly due to the performance of Edward Van Sloan. He is a very intelligent professor, but it's the dialogue he's given and the deductions he makes that really made me like the character. One of the best lines in the film comes when he says, the strength of the vampire is that people will not believe in him. It carries so much weight because he knows that his colleagues will dismiss his findings as mere superstition, but he is a very learned man and uses logical reasoning to come to his conclusions, much like the professor in the Chronicles of Narnia. He observes that the Count has no reflection in the mirror, he discovers that the cells of the blood of the deceased are being fed upon, and he has a patient in the asylum who feeds on the blood of insects and is enraged just by looking at Wolfsbane. He conducts experiments, and every finding is clever and well thought out. The battle between Van Helsing and Dracula is very much a battle of wits, and he proves that he can withstand even the Count's powers of suggestion using the force of his own will. I highly enjoyed watching Van Helsing in action, and it was a very different take for me because he is normally this badass bounty hunter or mercenary in modern films, but here he's just a very smart professor who's running circles around the Count. The only other real character of note for me was Renfield, due in large part because of the performance of Dwight Fry. He does a fantastic job in both aspects of the role, where he has to start off as this polite businessman and descend into this raving lunatic who has moments of clarity but is beholden to his master at the end of the day. He's able to switch on a dime, and his entire performance had me begging for more. It's not a very large role, but he still is extremely memorable and made much of the film a delight to watch. To be honest, he does feel a bit like Igor from the Frankenstein series. However, this film came out first, so perhaps Frankenstein took Renfield as a basis for Igor. Oh, wait. Igor wasn't in the first Frankenstein film, was he? Yeah, I believe it was a totally different hunchback. Hold on, hold on, let me check. Oh, look at that. It was literally Dwight Fry who played him. Well, now I just feel redundant. Either way, I loved him in the role, and it was a shame when he was killed at the end of the film. Well, in the Spanish version he was killed, in the English version he was kicked down some stairs, and we don't ever see him again. I'll touch upon this in a bit when I get to the Spanish version, but I hope he returns in the sequel because I need more Dwight Fry. The rest of the cast are alright, though not too notable. I want to give major praise to the Transylvanians in the beginning because they completely sold the fear of Dracula, but aside from them, the rest are just okay. Dr. Seward has little to no presence in the film, aside from not believing in vampires, but just goes along with Dr. Van Helsing for no reason. Mina is acted very well, but her role is pretty basic. 
Like, she's mostly there to expose it to her fiancé about nightmares she's been having recently, but she's essentially a damsel in distress. Her fiancé, John Harker, is a complete tool of a character who doesn't believe in anything even once he's been shown evidence of vampires. He's kind of a dumb character and I don't really care for him all that much. Aside from them, the only one I latched onto was Charles K. Gerard as Martin. He speaks in a completely over-the-top Cockney accent, and while he doesn't do much, I found his comedic timing very amusing. Overall, I think the main strength of the English adaptation is the cast itself, and how they utilize the limits of this new technology to their advantage. This version was directed by Todd Browning, and I think his strength lies in directing this cast. There are problems with cinematography and with the editing, but they didn't matter as much to me when the main cast sold me on the film. Is it perfect? No, I definitely feel like it's padded in the middle and could have used a bit more time with Van Helsing and Dracula together, but in the end, I highly enjoyed it. The sets are wonderfully constructed and do a great job eating the atmosphere, and I think for a 1931 film, this holds up remarkably well. Visually, it is an old-school black-and-white film, much like classic Doctor Who. It's very hard to criticize sets from this far back, but I actually feel it does better than Doctor Who because, aside from the beginning of the film, it relies less on matte painting backgrounds and more on actual, fully-fledged sets. Dracula's castle is fully covered in grime and cobwebs, and regardless of the black and white nature of the film, it still holds up tremendously, especially when they actually have stairs and other props to go along with these sets. As for the Spanish version, it is a wild ride. It is very similar, following all the same plot beats as the English version, but in many ways, it is completely different. First, let's focus on what it does well. The cinematography and editing is actually much better in this version of the film. The slow glide when Dracula descends the staircase is incredibly well done. If you're searching for the best looking version, the Spanish one is definitely better from a cinematic standpoint. At the same time, none of that matters because this version has the worst cast by far. The problems were obvious from the very beginning, with the Transylvanian citizens dialed back so damn much. In the English version, they have thick, heavy accents, but that's because English is not their native tongue, and it sells the fear in their voices. But in the Spanish version, everything is so muted that it almost feels like everyone took some Valium before getting on set. They don't appear to be afraid and calmly deliver their lines. It's not just a language barrier, because I've seen plenty of Spanish actors sell their lines. It just feels so much lesser by comparison, and that extends to the rest of the cast. Dracula, in the Spanish version, is played by Carlos Villarias, who is a textbook discount Dracula. He tries his best to imitate the performance and subtleties of Lugosi, but he just comes across as comical. His facial expressions are all so damn silly that I kept taking screenshots and asking people to caption them because he doesn't look evil. He has slightly better gliding movements, but none of that matters when his physicality is so comical and so hard to take seriously. It feels like a parody of The Count when it really shouldn't. He's the first in a long line of actors who try to mimic Lugosi whilst not being able to capture what made his performance so good. Then there's Pablo Elvarez Rubio, who has a different problem as Renfield. He is way too over the top. When Dwight Fry laughs maniacally, it is genuinely creepy. 
But when Rubio does it, he makes this incredibly weird jackal laugh that I couldn't take seriously. You have to have levels for Renfield where he feels like he's trying to get his grip on his sanity, but Rubio just plain goes to freaking 11 with every bit of the performance ignoring that subtlety. Van Helsing, on the other hand, is just okay. He's not bad, but he just doesn't sell the Professor persona that he's supposed to have. He is well acted, but I feel he needed more mystique to the performance since, you know, he's the protagonist of the film and is supposed to counter Dracula. It just feels off. Speaking of feeling off, while most of the cast actually look similar to their English counterparts, several of the main cast look so different that it is distracting if you've watched the English version of the film. Having different actors is fine, but they got a few of the cast to look eerily similar, so they almost feel the same. Then there's Dr. Seward, who looks nothing like the English version, and it's a problem in this case because he does not look like a doctor. What's also distracting is that the attendant for Renfield in the Spanish version looks Scottish in this version, which is directly at odds with the London Cockney persona from the English version of the film. It's weird to me because none of this is necessarily bad, but I found myself so distracted by these casting choices and nothing feels natural. It feels like a farce and a portion of that comes with the changes they made to the script. There is no fear or build up in the beginning anymore. The carriage driver just drops Renfield off without dashing away. The villagers calmly tell him not to go, but don't seem afraid whatsoever, and there's no urgency in any of the doctor's visits to discover if the vampire is actually a vampire. The only change that actually works is that they straight up have Dracula throw Renfield off the side of the stairs, sending him plummeting to his death instead of rolling harmlessly down the stone steps. That gives Dracula menace, but everything else in this version is muted. They even change some dialogue to make some scenes read more accurately. I don't know if this is a translation problem, but the scene where Dracula first meets Renfield is awkward for all the wrong reasons now, and altogether, I feel this is the lesser version. However, I would still recommend tracking this down because, damn, it is a trip. It's easily obtainable online, via archive websites, and I believe even YouTube. However, thanks to my good friend Linkara, I have learned that it is also available on a DVD set version of the English film. In the end, I consider Dracula a classic film. It has surprisingly aged quite well over the years, with only a few dated elements, but none of those were major issues for me. It's still really enjoyable, and so I'm going to give the English version of Dracula a Kana stamp of approval plus. It has its issues, and I don't think everyone will enjoy it, but it is a classic, and it shaped the landscape of horror films for decades to come. As for the Spanish version, I give it the coveted stamp of Manos. What this means is that it is a film so bad it is enjoyable to watch. There are certainly boring parts to the film, but it has to be seen to be believed, and much like Manos, The Hands of Fate, every screenshot of that film feels like someone's last known photograph. With all that being said, I'm Zenith Warrior Princess, the cutest of buns, and I will see you all next time. Thank you all so much for watching. If you like what you see, don't forget to smash that like button like Frankenstein, comment like the Invisible Man, and subscribe like Dracula's many followers so that you too can join the Bun Squad, my legion of cute fluffy bunnies that enjoys my videos. And while you're here, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Special thanks to Victory Buster, Kyle Huxtable, Troy Lundquist, 
Raichu Overlord Ben, James Bevan, the smartest moron, which is a great handle by the way, and Seraphim for supporting the channel already. Another reminder that if you donate $20, you'll have a chance to request a movie, game, TV show, or anime of your choosing for me to review on the Bun Squad. And as always, don't forget to hit that bell so that you can get notified of every new video. Have a good one, everybody! So, hey y'all. Uh, to be real for a second and break character, we're really sorry for not having any Xenoween videos this past year. Or any videos at all, really, after the Blood Blockade Battlefront review. Not to mention this anniversary review once again coming out late. Needless to say, we weren't expecting all of these delays to have happened, and it hampered our schedule tremendously. And for that, we're sorry. As many of you know by now, this was originally supposed to be a Xenoween one-shot to hold you guys over for the initial lineup we had planned for the Despair arc, but our schedule became super tight, and it only made sense to push this one back. But we also didn't want to scrap it since we had you guys vote on this over on Patreon. So, as such, we decided to make it the anniversary episode. Not just because Dracula itself had its anniversary, but also to represent our love for you all sticking with us throughout a crazy year of drought. Thank you all so much, really. It means more than you could ever imagine. And thank you to everyone who voted on the poll that decided that Dracula would be what we cover for the one-shot. We hope it was good enough to hold you over for this year's Xenoween. Unfortunately, that's also going to have to be a one-shot given that we aren't going to be able to finish the current arc by then due to delays, and given the specific structure of the arc, it'd be too much of a hassle to work around adding three whole reviews to the schedule. But as always, we hope you guys enjoyed the video regardless, and we can't wait to see you guys again as we slide back into the Despair arc. Oh, and uh, one last thing. You may have noticed that over the past year, things haven't just exclusively been about Zen. I myself have found a new home on the channel, Cat and Doug took over diving into DuckTales, and Khan and Chiaki have been more prominent as time passes, with our lovely voice actors Casey and Michelle continuing to put their all in their roles. I know it may seem as if we're diverting from the star of the show, but that's just the thing. Zen isn't our only star anymore. She's our main one, but the Bun Squad has become so much more. Much like Zen's previous channel and its main show, The Media Meltdown, it's a place for us to showcase different media of all kinds. But this time around, that love is able to come from a bunch of different people from all corners of the world. And quite frankly, we thought it was time we started reflecting that. So from this moment onward, while Zenith Warrior Princess is and will continue to be this channel's main star, she will no longer be the singular person to represent the channel. Nor will I, or Casey, or Michelle, or anyone else who comes on board in the future. From now, this channel belongs to all of us, and collectively, we will continue to expand the channel and provide you with content we can all be happy with. So with that being said, I'm Philip, and welcome everybody to the Bunt Squad.